Hallelujah, church. He has done great things. Oh, my goodness. And for that, we are glad this morning. Oh, hallelujah to his name. We just praise him this morning. I'm going to come from, again, Psalm 100. And it says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, church, and bless his name this morning. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Let's give him praise this morning. Let's give him praise this morning. Hallelujah, Father. You're a good God. You're a mighty God. You're an awesome God. Oh, we just love you this morning, and we want to shout hallelujah, hallelujah this morning. Thank you, precious Lord. Thank you. 
Your loving kindness is better than life. As you may recall, I'm preaching through a series of the I Am Statements of revelations of Jesus found in the book of John. Now who remembers what we have gone over thus far? I believe one was, I am the bread of life. Another one, I am the light of the world. Then we came with, I am the door. And then I am the good shepherd. And today we're coming from chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. And I will read a few verses from John chapter 11, starting at the 17th verse. So when Jesus came and found that he had already been in the tomb four days, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you asked of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The topic today is I am the resurrection and the life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come worship you and praise your holy name and celebrate you, Lord, and learn a little bit more about you, Lord, about this faith that we have. And Father, I pray that as I began to share this word, that you be with me, Lord, as you have been with me in the preparation for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A preacher, a preacher once told his congregation, someday every member of this church shall die. The congregation was stunned, except for one man in the back who laughed and said, I am glad I'm not a member of this church. <laughs> but the reality is, that death will visit every one of us. Death is something that we do not like to think about, something we do not like to talk about. There is a story about a king of France, King Louis XV, who was so fearful of death that he did not want anybody to talk about it in his presence. He was so fearful of death, he went out of his way to avoid every suggestion of death. My brothers and sisters, no matter how much we try to avoid the subject, we know that one day this body will expire. But we also know that we as people of faith have the earnest expectation or the hope that we will live, continue to live with Christ. And that is what this illustration is all about, where Jesus is talking to the sisters of Lazarus and letting them know that he is the resurrection and the life. As we look at this, we must go back to the beginning of chapter 11. Jesus is nearby in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. And in the 
first verse of chapter 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. And it was that Mary who had anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You got to wonder, what was he talking about as he was sharing that with his disciples? Here he is two miles away from Bethany, and he's saying that this sickness is not unto death. And verse 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. That's the topic for another day. But if you love somebody so much, why are you going to linger? Well, I'm so glad that Jesus let us know why. In the seventh verse, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. That's where Bethany was located. Jesus, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? The disciples were trying to be helpful, uh, 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 just in case, Jesus, you forgot. We've had some close calls lately. And why do we want to go back there again? Are you sure? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he will not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him up. 12th verse, then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. And then the 14th verse says, then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Then in the 16th verse, then Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Again, that's the subject for another day. You know, we always have people around us who just don't get it. And say things that are out of context. And then that 17th verse. That 17th verse. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Four days. Jesus, after he got the message, lingered in Jerusalem for two more days. Don't know how long it took for the message to get to him. That Lazarus was sick. That Lazarus was dying, but Jesus waited. And he found that he had been in the tomb for four days. Four days in the tomb is confirmation that you are not getting up. And in the 18th verse, it says, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews who had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Just like today, it is our obligation. It is our obligation to comfort those who mourn. It is our obligation through the empathy we have within us to be with them, to be with them. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary. You see, the women had already come together. The women had helped 
prepare the body. And others came to mourn. There's an important point here. For when Jesus does what Jesus does, he has witnesses around to confirm that the miracle did, in fact, happen. In verse 20, now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. One sister went to see Jesus while Mary sat in the house by the door. You see, it was customary when you were mourning somebody to have somebody sit in the house and greet the guest who would come and mourn with you. And there would be periods of silence when nobody was speaking. And then somebody would burst out in cries and in tears. Just as it was then, it is the same today. We come together to mourn. Sometimes that's the only time we have every union is when somebody passes away. But this is a tale of two sisters. Martha was the busy one. Martha was the most outgoing one. Martha was the engaging one. Martha was the one cooking and feeding while Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. You see, Mary was the more meditative one more contemplative one. They had different personalities, but they both had a love for God and a love for Jesus and a love for their brother, and they both mourned for their brother. In Luke chapter 10, starting at, starting at the 39th verse, another illustration of their different personalities. 39th verse, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving as she approached him saying, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed and Mary has chosen the good part which will not be taken away from her. In other words, Jesus said, let Mary be Mary. Let her sit and listen to my teaching. You take care of the nourishment. So we have two sisters who were both mourning their brother who was now dead, and they had many of the community had come to be with them in their mourning. And the 21st verse says, now, Mary's, now Martha said to Jesus, Martha, who has now approached Jesus, she has heard Jesus has come. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. On one hand, Martha is confessing her faith in Jesus by acknowledging him as a healer. After all, many healings had been witnessed by many individuals that Jesus had done. And she was acknowledging him as the healer. If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. You would have anointed him. You would have laid hands on him. You would have done something. And he would not be sick anymore. You see, this, these are the words of the grieving sister who wished and hoped 
and prayed for a different outcome? How many times have we questioned the Lord's presence, how it might have changed situations in our lives? How many times have we thought the thought, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, why did my loved one have to die? Lord, why do tragedies happen? Why do disasters happen in the world? Lord, why? Why am I going through these trials and tribulations? Why, Lord? But have we ever taken the time to think about it from another point of view? Because, see, it is our tendency to think about things like this when bad things happen. But do we think about, Lord, where were you when the good things happen? Lord, where were you, Lord, when I was driving down the highway and my tire was going flat? Where were you, Lord? When I was riding a beast of burden that I had never ridden before. Where were you, Lord? Where were you, Lord? When I was taking the test that I passed successfully, Lord. You were right there with me. Where were you, Lord? During my good times. When I forgot to thank you, Lord. Where were you, Lord, as I was driving down the highway, Lord, realizing that anything could have happened? You were right there, Lord. Where were you, Lord, the last time I stepped on an airplane, Lord, realizing that I'm getting in a, a tube that will go to a high altitude? with very few safety measures if something negative happened. Where were you, Lord? I was right there. Yes, yes, yes. Where were you, Lord? Yes. When I cried all night because there was more month than money. Where were you, Lord? When I woke up, Lord, and saw a solution right in front of me. You were right there in the midst, Lord. Yes, yes. Where were you, Lord? When I woke up in the morning, I believe, Lord, that you were there keeping me safe yes. during my sleep and slumber. Yes. Where were you, Lord? When I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, you were right there, Lord, with your rod and your staff. Where were you, Lord? Amen. Yes. When the aches and pains of life in the body come forth, Lord, you are right there with me, Lord. Yes. Where were you, Lord, when the doctor gave me the diagnosis that I didn't want to hear? Lord, you orchestrated things, Lord. Where were you, Lord? I think that each of us can think about times when the Lord was there with us. Yes, yes, sir. Even though we didn't acknowledge it at the time, he was there. Yes, 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 yes. You see, it's easy to think of where were you, Lord, when disaster happens. But can we thank the Lord for being with us at all times? Can we thank the Lord for being with us and encouraging us in the midst of our morning? Can we think about the times that we had with the Lord when we look back over our lives and we look back and I'm getting to that age where a lot of my classmates and friends are no longer with us. And all I can say is thank you, Lord, that it wasn't me. We don't know how many days we have left. 
but we do know the days that we have left is not the end of the story because we have the Lord in our life. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus waited two days. He waited two days because he wanted to drive home a point. He wanted to let them know that he is still in control. Look at verse 22. Even though she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In verse 22, she says, but even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. You see, Martha knew the word. She knew the word. She knew the prophecies of the Old Testament about the resurrection. She knew the word. And she was like most of us would have been. I know he will rise again. You see, she had the faith that her brother was saved and would be resurrected in the last days. But this set the stage for Jesus' teachable moment. And quite often he used illustrations like this to teach about himself and the power that God had given him. You see, to a believer, death is a transition for the body. But death does not kill our spiritual life. John 3.16, we all know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In John chapter 5, verse 24, when Jesus is teaching about himself in the temple, he talks about the Son of God and the Son of Man and how he equates himself with God, rightfully so. In the 24th, 24th verse, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Skipping down to the 28th verse of John chapter 5. Do not marvel at this. Do not marvel at the fact that I am the Son of Man and I am the Son of God. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is come in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There will be a final resurrection one day. Everybody will be resurrected. But for us who are saved, the resurrection of life. But for those who are not saved, is the resurrection of condemnation. And then we turn to John chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Out of my hand. You see, Jesus had been teaching about this the whole time, about the resurrection, about who he is, who he is. And then going back to John chapter 11, we're at the 25th verse now. Jesus said to her, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked the question to Martha. You see, at the death of a believer, their soul goes to be with the Lord. Yes, we still mourn. We still miss them. We still grieve. We still ask, Lord, if you have been here. That is how you act when you love somebody. That is how you act 
When you've been with somebody for a long time, if they have encouraged you, they have nurtured you, they have raised you up, that is the way you act. So nobody's going to blame Martha for saying, Lord, if you had been here. Because in reality, we all have said the same thing a time or two in our lives. But Jesus is now saying, do you believe this? Do you believe that I am the resurrection and the life? He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. This is one of the foundational foundations of our faith, my brothers and sisters. We not only have life right now, but we will have eternal life. Paul, y'all remember Paul, that man called Saul, who became a believer after being a hater. You see, that's the thing about this relationship we have with Jesus Christ. He can take haters and make them into believers. But Paul is talking to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. And he has given them assurance of the resurrection. Remember, this is somebody who saw Jesus face to face. This is somebody who was made blind on the road to Damascus. And once the scales came off of his eyes, he was a changed person. But here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Paul shares his perspective with the church in Philippi, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in verse 27, Martha, I'm back, John 11. Jesus has just finished saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she says to him, yes, Lord. (laughs) You can stop right there. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I Believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Yes, Lord. The resurrection happened. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now I have to pause for a moment and share something that just came into a spirit, my spirit. Something kind of funny about resurrection. You see, we used to go fishing when I was a boy in the ocean. And one time, instead of pulling up a fish, I pulled up an eel that was about three feet long. And the eel got loose in the boat. And I had to stop my sister from jumping out of the boat. You know, there are sometimes there is danger, more danger out of the boat (laughs) than within the boat. But my father, being the country boy that he was, when you found something alive, you figured out how to cook it. So we took that eel home. My mother was not happy because she did not go fishing with us. But my dad figured out how to cook the eel. But first he cut it up and froze it 
because he was in the military and had to go away for a few weeks. And when he got back, he thawed it out. And as it started thawing out, it started jumping. Yes. It was jumping. And the pieces were jumping in unison. Together, it was moving. And it was like Dad was saying, could this be the resurrection? You see, he knew something that we didn't know. Here we are as children looking at this, trying to figure out how something could stay in the freezer for two weeks. And once it thawed out, started jumping. It wasn't until I got much older and in the age of the internet, I decided to look it up and see why did that eel jump? You see, that eel has nerves that can still be activated after death. Usually when you put some salt or something hits it, it can start jumping again. But these nerves still acted after being frozen. Now, as I thought about that, I thought about the fact that many people who came before Jesus tried to pretend that they were the son of God. And through the sleigh of hands and special lighting, they had things happen that tried to support their thesis that they were the son of God. I know many of us have been to the state fair, have been to county fairs where they have the trailers that have the advertisements on the outside about something on the inside that is beyond belief. And as you pay your hard, hard earned money to go on the inside, because I just got to see this with my own eyes. You find out that is not what they said it was. But I dare say it here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that when we talk about Jesus, I like the way that Jesus did what he's about to do. You see, Jesus made sure he waited a couple of extra days. He made sure that Lazarus was in the grave for a number of days. He made sure that there were witnesses around, that the Jews were around, and, and the family was around, and the women were around to attest to the fact that this was not a sleigh of hands. This was not suspended animation. This was not something that was common to those who know the sorcery. But this what was about to happen was a, a blessing from God, a miracle from God. And, and as before we get there, I want to highlight again what Mary said in the 27th verse. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into this world. Now, can you have that faith before the miracle happens? Think about it. Look at this confession of faith that she says right here. Number one, she says, you are the Christ. Number two, you are the son of God. John chapter 1, verse 49, Nathaniel, one of the disciples, was called by Jesus. Once Jesus had told him where he was under the fig tree, that he had seen him. Nathaniel said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then she says, you are the son of God. You are who is to come into the world. In other words, she says, you are the fulfillment for God's people. A few pages from this, when Jesus is making his triumphal entry, 
In John 12, 13, we see that they took up the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord, King of Israel. You are the one to come. Martha believed because she knew the prophecy that the Messiah will be the ruler and will be the king, and he is the one who is to come into the world. In Bible study, we are studying the prophecies of the Old Testament that are come to reality in the New Testament. And one of them from last week was Micah chapter 5, verse 2, where Micah, the prophecy was, but you, Bethlehem, through you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That was a 700-year prop, 700 year before Christ came, a prophecy that he would be born in Bethlehem. Not only would he be born in Bethlehem, but he would be the ruler of that they were expecting, that God had told them about, that he was there from the beginning and he will be here from everlasting. Martha had faith, but she still asked, or still said, if you had been here. Now to fast forward, this is not the end of this illustration because many of us know what is about to happen. Jesus goes on to talk to Mary. And Mary even says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Jesus and Martha and the group, they go to the tomb. And then the 32nd verse, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, there it is. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Mary saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned because he knew that he mourned along with them. He, he groaned because he had empathy for them. He groaned because he knew that his job was to relieve us of this pain. His job was to let us know that our life shall not end. And Jesus said in the 34th verse, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Here's the shortest version of scripture in the Bible. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. They saw how Jesus loved Lazarus. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time, there is a stench, or he is stinking, for he has been dead four days. Now, 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 that is an understatement. A stench is when you take off your dirty socks. A stench is when something goes wrong. A stench is what fills your kitchen when cooking does not come out the way you want it. He was stinking. Anybody who had been in the grave for four days. Now, in this time, the children of Israel, when we think of people in the grave in ancient times, we think of the mummies. All wrapped up, all embalmed. Now, children of Israel did not do that. They put spices on you and covered you up. And that was it. He's been dead four days. Verse 40, then Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up 
his eyes and said, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. You see, the miracle and the reason for this miracle was not necessarily for us to think that Jesus would always come to the grave after four days to raise somebody up, but it was to increase the faith of those who were surrounding them. That's why he spoke out loud instead of talking to his father in silence. He said, these things that I said, that they may believe that you have sent me. I dare say that Martha, Mary, and those who attended this event today received a taste of God's power. They saw a man raised from the dead. And the 45th verse says, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. Amen. This was a foretaste or a promo for what was to come later when Jesus was put in a grave, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, when Jesus was put in a borrowed grave and a stone was rolled across the door, when Jesus was guarded by a squad of Roman soldiers, when Jesus, on the third day, when Jesus, on the third day, the women came to anoint and put spices on the body. But when they came, the door was open. And Jesus was not there. Jesus is the resurrection. For he was resurrected. He was resurrected and was visibly seen by a multitude of people. Over 500 people saw him before he ascended to be with the Father. Talking about eyewitness news. Over 500 people saw him. There is a reality to the resurrection. And I am so glad for the resurrection. I'm so glad because that tells me that this life I'm living is not in vain. This faith that I have is not in vain. That I will live again. But Jesus said, not only am I the resurrection, but I am the life. My brothers and sisters, I am the life. One day we will be with the Father. One day in that great resurrection, we will receive new bodies. One day we will be with the Father for eternity. But until that day, Jesus came because not only did he give us resurrection, but he is the life. So the life we live today we must live this knowing that Jesus is on our side. We must live it victoriously knowing that, yes, we will go through the aches and pains of life. Yes, we will mourn when our loved ones decease. Yes, we will cry out through the pain in our bodies. Yes, that will happen. But we have life because we are not going through this alone. We have Jesus as our constant companion. We have the one who walks with us, who talks with us. We have the one who comforts us, who is there for us, who protects us. That's who we have in our life. Jesus, as they saw on that day. It says many of the Jews believed because they saw this with their eyes. We see this with our spiritual eyes. 
We were not there on that day, but through our faith, through our faith, we have the insurance and we have the earnest expectation, which means hope, that one day we will see him face to face. Job, after all the things that had happened to Job, Job was assured that one day, I will see him face to face. One day, I will see that mighty scroll, and I will see my name engraved on it. One day, in spite of everything that has happened to me, in spite of how it might look like, I should be down and out, praying for my death. I know that one day, I will be vindicated. And Job was indeed vindicated. My brothers and sisters, bad things will happen to us. Bad things will happen. Just because we are a child of God does not mean that we are immune to bad things happening. But what this means is that bad things do not need to keep us down. For just as he got up, we will get up also. God bless you. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am. God bless you.